everyone. I am delighted uh, to be here today. And uh, it would be lovely, actually, if people put in the chat where they're signing in from. It's always exciting to see how this platform can uh, bring us all together from various parts of the world. So I'm coming today to you from Pakistan, actually. I am in Karachi visiting family. And uh, when uh, Muhattasa reached out to me, uh, Musarat reached out to me, I was like, you know what, this is as good a time as any. So uh, before, uh, you know, the year gets too busy, I thought, let's do it. So inshallah. And uh, for those of you who've heard me before know that my style is pretty casual. I generally like a lot of interaction, but in this forum with uh, so many people, I'm not sure, um, but maybe we can keep that, uh, for, uh, you know, for the, for the chats. And uh, if you could just, uh, you know, manage the waiting room, there are people uh, still coming in. And I see there are people from the UK, from Nairobi, uh, from India, from uh, Tanzania. Uh, so lots of people from UK. And I recognize some names from uh, Toronto as well. So welcome, everyone. I am just going to share my uh, screen so that we can follow along. And by the way, if you hear things in the background, uh, just let me know. You know, uh, one thing I've noticed in, uh, in Pakistan and in Karachi that, you know, those of us who live in the West, we have very quiet homes. <laughs> and here there is just always something going on. I mean, I'm always uh, stunned to see how often the doorbell rings and how much noise there is from outside. So, you know, just bear with me if that happens, I will do my best to uh, not let it interfere. And uh, let's see. Okay, so everyone can see the, uh, the PowerPoint okay? Okay, so our topic today is uh, staying uh, happily married uh, in the 21st century. So, you know, uh, a few things. One of the things that I get asked most often is uh, the challenges of getting married, because in this day and age, in the 21st century, it's actually quite a challenge to, uh, you know, to get married in the first place, to find uh, spouses, and many people um, actually uh, you know, um, are, you know, challenged in that, but that, uh, you know, we will leave for a different conversation. Today, we're going to be talking about once we do find somebody, how do we, um, you know, continue to stay happily married? How do we maintain that kind of love, affection, um, optimism that we experienced when we first got together with someone? So our agenda is we will talk a little bit about the difference between traditional and modern marriage, uh, just to understand why it is so challenging, right? The topic is uh, staying married in the 21st century, and I will submit to you that the challenges of the 21st century are quite significant. And uh, then we will talk about what commitment means, you know, because one of the differences, what we will realize, the difference between traditional and modern marriage is that we are kind of redefining what commitment means. And many people would say that, you know what, people are quote unquote, not committed, uh, you know, for the long term. And so we will, you know, hopefully uh, shed a little bit of uh, a different view on that. And then we will talk about the three keys to staying happily married. And these are not, uh, they're more like, how do you approach it? Right, because clearly, in you know, in an hour-long session, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot hope to uh, to do everything. And uh, you know, I'll share with you some resources that um, I have, uh, you know, available on various uh, platforms uh, on the web. So, uh, inshallah, you can continue the learning certainly beyond this session. So, the million-dollar question, right? Why are marriages so fragile today? And why does it matter? So, you know, we know that those of us, um, you know, who have parents, uh, gen obviously generation above us, uh, even grandparents, it was quite, you know, marriage was a stable institution of society. You could count that if somebody got married, that they would be staying married for the rest of the life of you know who whoever kind of passed on first right and now it is we know it's it's no longer the case right not only is it not the case in the west it certainly is not the case among uh, our own faith it is not the case even uh, in the east so uh, you know people are kind of hedging their bets 
So traditional marriage, it was very stable, right? The goal of marriage very often was child rearing, financial stability, and also family alliances. You know, we, we've all heard of, of families who, who got married, uh, you know, in the same kind of extended family system to keep the family together because they thought that they knew each other well for whatever reason, okay? Also options for single women in particular were really limited. So if you were not married, you were kind of waiting, you know, you were waiting to start your life. You had very little freedom. And, um, you know, for a woman, uh, particularly life started after you got married, kind of, okay? Also, the roles in relationships were very clearly defined. You know, the, the male was the bread earner, the woman was supposed to stay at home. Even if she did work, it was, um, uh, it was in um, her career always came second to the man's. And very importantly, in traditional marriage, personal happiness was not a conscious goal of most people. This is really important to recognize. Why? Because if you speak to your parents or to your grandparents, you know, people in their 50s, 60s and above, when they got married, happiness was kind of not, um, not on the radar. You know, you got married, definitely it was a commitment. Commitment means you stayed together, what came. And uh, the idea was that, uh, you know, people's roles were defined and that you would make a life together, okay? So now let's see what has changed. In, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, in modern marriage, uh, women in particular have greatly enhanced economic choices and freedom. So uh, before, if they, you know, till even if they were under their uh, father's roof, they were subservient to the father, they were accountable to them for the economics, for even mobility, you know, uh, all of that education. And women today uh, have greater economic choices. Many women have careers, they have uh, studied a lot. So they have the education, they have skills. The stigma of divorce is also greatly reduced. So before, uh, if you got married, the thought of divorce, you know, there were a lot of constraints. Uh, people would think, you know, 10 times before uh, taking that step. And now because it has become so common, it is, um, there's not that kind of stigma anymore. Before where everything was um, clearly defined, you know, the roles of a relationship were clearly defined. Today, everything is negotiable. There is, you cannot enter a marriage, a modern young couple cannot assume uh, that uh, one person will stay at home, uh, that the other will work, who will work, uh, who will raise the kids, where they will live, whether or not they will live with their extended families, everything, absolutely everything is negotiable. We also, uh, you know, a slightly on a different note, um, the reason why also marriages are more fragile is because people have easier access to alternative romantic uh, partners, right? So, um, you know, the social media. Before, if, if two people were living at home, you could pretty much assume that they were faithful, right? Today, you can, uh, you can cheat on your spouse, you can look elsewhere you, without leaving home. You know, as long as you have an internet connection, you can form um, relationships outside your marriage. And obviously that is a very No sound. Sister Marzia, we can't hear you. Are you on mute? You can't hear? No, we can't hear. Okay, now we can hear you. Ah, okay. Um, so just, you know, what I would do is just raise your hand if you can't hear me, um, so that I, uh, I will know. Okay. Uh, so there are a lot of expectations of personal happiness to be fulfilled within the marriage relationship. This is a huge change, right? When people, two people get married today, they expect that the other will fulfill their needs, desires, make them happy. 
And uh, this is again a double-edged sword, and we need to understand, uh, you know, how this impacts the stability of the marriage, and how realistic is it to expect one person to fulfill all of those roles? Okay. So definitely, uh, it is more challenging today to get married. Absolutely, it is also more challenging to stay married. Uh, also. However, the good news, the really good news is that it is also an opportunity to grow marriages that are loving and healthy and that provide a source of comfort and love for the family. OK, this is something, again, we very often talk about challenges that, you know, people today don't have, uh, you know, patience is the biggest thing you will hear. Right. And the way I look at it is that if you are dealing with abuse or bad behavior, you know, patience is not what is called for, right? So because marriages are so fragile, we actually have the opportunity to build marriages that are meeting the needs, as many needs as possible of both spouses. And it is definitely a fairer kind of, uh, a more sustainable kind of relationship, okay? So let's now look at a little bit about on commitment. Right. So we hear very often people are not committed, you know, they get married sometimes, you know, everyone has it in their head. If, if it doesn't work out, I have options. I can look elsewhere. I can end the relationship. OK, so what commitment means and why it matters. Let's talk a little bit about why commitment matters first. First of all, commitment matters because it influences our behavior. If say, let's take an example of being committed to a job, OK, to a career. If you are committed to a career, to a job, you know that it will influence your behavior. You will invest in it. You will do what it takes. You will sacrifice for it. And uh, if you are committed, you're not going to look elsewhere, right? You're not going to be uh, monitoring uh, what we call alternative monitoring. You're not going to be um, on the horizon for another place, uh, even if things get challenging. For example, if you, you know, if your team currently is experiencing challenges, you're not going to throw in the towel at the first sign of trouble, right? Um, and you will also, if you have job security and you're committed both ways, it provides a stable foundation for your economics, right? Same exact thing with uh, uh, with a relationship, right? So if you're committed to a relationship, it definitely influences our behavior. It provides a stable foundation. Uh, you know, we don't look elsewhere, which easier said than done in today's day and age, right? And uh, we keep going even when things are challenging. And here's the thing, you know, I, I don't know how many of us are married for a long time, but if you are, you already know this, that in any long-term relationships, there will be challenging times. And this does not mean that there is anything wrong with your relationship. You know, that's something really important to, um, uh, to know, okay? So, um, so we have different types of commitment, right? We have what is called structural commitment. In other words, uh, for example, if you have signed a contract with a firm, right? You, uh, you don't have an out for two years or whatever it is. That's a structural commitment. Uh, you have a moral commitment, which means I ought to, you know, I really ought to give this a good shot. And then you have what we call personal commitment. In other words, I really want to do this. Okay. So similarly in marriage, you have the structural commitment. Uh, and in the old days, the structural commitment used to be the most important thing, right? You had signed that contract of marriage, the nikah had been read, and therefore you were committed. Uh, there was a lot of moral commitment, right? They may not have been that much personal commitment. In other words, people didn't think that they had a choice, right? Because they were married, they had to kind of make it work. You know, you, you hear about these things, your, your mothers or your grandmothers uh, were told, for example, that uh, when you get married, uh, only your funeral should leave the house, right? I, I'm not sure if you ever heard that, but I know I heard that a lot growing up. Okay, so um, this was the kind. Now, the the thing is because the the you know the constraints to marriage have become less. Um, they you know in the old days marriages were constrained; they were stable.
Sound gone? Sure, what's happening? Can you hear? Yes, we can hear now, yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, personal commitment uh, or dedication means that uh, you actually want to invest in the relationship so that you're happy, not just stuck. You know, so it's the opposite of uh, I choose this relationship uh, as opposed to I committed, I signed the contract, I had the nikah, and therefore I'm stuck. Okay, so there's a big difference in how you approach relationships, and it really matters. And, you know, when we, uh, you know, those of us who are older, for example, when we preach tolerance and patience to uh, the young people of today, this is where we really miss the mark. Right, because when we are only talking about tolerance and patience, what we're suggesting is even if the other person is demonstrating poor behavior, you know, there may be abuse sometimes or whatever's happening, just tolerate it and just be patient. And the thing is, it's not going to fly, right? It's not going to impact the young people today like it did the previous generations. And I would go a little bit further and I would say that it shouldn't either. You know, the way I look at it, that God has actually made a way out in relationships where things are really troubled. So the challenge is not to only display patience. The challenge is to nurture our relationships so that they actually meet the needs of both people and that they are, uh, it is a nourishing, uh, you know, uh, environment for both spouses. And, and this is why we need to aim higher than, than patience, right? We need to uh, advocate for dedication, for uh, commitment towards this kind of, uh, of marriage, okay? And the skills needed, you know, uh, in the old days were simply patience, tolerance, self-control, right? And now we need a lot more skills, right? We need awareness, we need communication skills, we need uh, relationship skills, we need to know love languages, right? It takes, uh, you know, if you're stuck in a relationship, there's very little that you need to do except self-control, right? But when you want to build a relationship which is uh, worth emulating, which is, uh, you know, which is uh, making two people happy, then obviously it is uh, slightly more, uh, work as well, right? So to keep uh, marriages stable in the 21st century, dedication and personal commitment must go up as constraints have come down. And this is a really key point. Uh, and, you know, this helps us to understand why marriages are less stable and fragile in the 21st century is because constraints to dissolving the marriage, such as uh, social stigma, such as economic problems, such as lack of education, all of those constraints are no longer holding, right? And so in order to keep marriages uh, stable continuously, we must, uh, you know, learn to invest and to have dedication in that relationship. So the task, you know, there's a lot of good news. It's not all bad news. And the good news is that the, the task of modern marriage, which is to create fulfilling relationships through dedicated commitment, is actually completely in line with the Islamic standard. So what does Islam tell us um, about relationships uh, and about the spouse relationships in particular? And this is a beautiful dua that is found in Surah Furqan, where Allah says, uh, all, oh, our Lord, grant us the delight of our eyes in our spouses. Qurrata ayunan means so when you're so happy, qurrata ayunan means that you are so happy at seeing the sight of someone that you have um, tears in your eyes. You know, it's a very high level of joy. And this is what we are asking for in our relationships. It's not an uninspiring kind of um, situation where you know one person gets to do what they want and the other person has to grit their teeth, bear it, and uh, you know use patience and tolerance. This is not the Islamic standard, okay? And, and the and the dua follows uh, that make us imams of the muttaqin, right? Make us leaders. In other words, make you know leaders are who who take um, who pave the way for others right so if we uh, you know those of us who are married we have this responsibility to to create marriages that will 
inspire people who want to get married, who will want to emulate us, right? Who will want to, uh, who will want to know the secret to why we are so happy. Another very good piece of news is that, you know, in the old days, how did people learn about relationships? How did people find out what needed to be done? Generally, you know, you saw your parents, obviously, um, you know, how they related. And sometimes it was good, sometimes it was not so good. And then when you got married, you got, you know, the normal lecture about how to be tolerant and how to have patience and commitment. And none of these are bad things, by the way. Uh, but these were, you know, generally older aunties uh, giving you their piece of advice. It came from a lot of experience and it was sometimes very good news. Today, the study of relationships is a science. What that means is that it's very predictable. You know, uh, when, uh, you know, when people are looking to get married and they will come for, for premarital guidance or for premarital counseling, it's actually really simple to tell them, you know what, you do this, your relationship will get better, you do, um, uh, you know, something else and it won't. So what makes marriages succeed or fail is actually highly predictable. And another piece of good news uh, is that they're not big things. You know, here uh, today, one of the challenges of social media is that it's all about, you know, go big or go home. You know, when I see um, Instagram worthy proposals, for example, right? People uh, proposing in such a grand way, making grand gestures of uh, declaring their love, fine. You know, if, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, I mean, I have lots to say about it, but I won't. But what I will say is that things like that have zero predictive value in how happy you're going to be, right? So the way I look at it is why not invest in the right things? You know, why not learn a little bit about what will actually make you happier in life and then do those things, you know, spend your time, effort, resources, uh, money, all of those things on things that are actually going to make your marriage happier rather than, um, than wasting your resources, your time on things which will actually really not matter, right? So, um, so what are those things? And now, again, when I'm talking about the three keys, these are not tips, they're not tricks, they're not strategies. They are the overarching vision with what, with what you approach a relationship, okay? And so the first uh, key to a relationship uh, is to decide, don't slide. What does that mean? It means that we actually for, are intentional in our relationships. Uh, intentional means, uh, again, you know, when we talked about commitment, when you make a commitment to, uh, to something, you need to do it with uh, knowing what you're getting into, right? And, and why we say decide, don't slide, or decide, don't drift, uh, is that no one drifts to a destination that they would choose. What does this mean? You know, uh, let's take an example of health, okay? If, you know, as I grow older, uh, if I'm not intentional about nurturing my body, keeping healthy, doing what it takes, the natural order of things is that I am going to deteriorate, right? If I don't take active measures to, to do something about it, uh, I am going to lose whatever flexibility I had. I'm going to lose uh, even, um, you know, in many ways, right? So I need to be intentional in, in keeping healthy and uh, deciding that this is something that I need to invest my time, money, energy, resources in, right? So similarly with a relationship, you know, if we just leave our relationships and, you know, once you get married, many times, you know, all this, the storybooks, for example, they will tell you, happy, uh, happy ending, right? That uh, the work is all done, you have, you know, done whatever you needed to, and now is the time to enjoy the fruits. That it's not, life quite doesn't work like that, right? When you actually end up with someone, you, that's the beginning of the, of the marriage, right? That's the beginning of your life. So deciding means, slide, uh, not sliding, it means that you'll be intentional about it. You know where you want to go. You know what kind of relationship you want to, uh, to want to create and nurture. 
So, uh, you know, the thing is that all of us, we slide in different ways. Uh, you know, we don't think about it. Uh, and before we know it, we are someplace where we didn't intend to be. So one example I gave was health, right? But for couples, let's take um, the decision to have children. You know, when you get married, uh, people might assume that both, uh, both people want children and when they want children and uh, how many and all of that. And the thing is that if you haven't discussed it and it just sort of happens, you know, you either, you know, get pregnant or you don't kind of thing, that's an example of, of sliding into a situation. Uh, I mean, I don't want to compare uh, kids to pets, but uh, getting a pet, for example, right? Um, committing to a pet without knowing what it's going to take without knowing the kind of energy it's going to take, the kind of resources, the kind of looking after. And uh, before you know it, it's much more than you bargained for, right? That's an example of sliding. Uh, money and career. Very often people slide um, because they haven't discussed these things. It's just assumed that one person will, um, will be the major breadwinner, that uh, somebody will give up their career when you move. Uh, you know, somebody is going to be more important. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, debt is a very big uh, slide sometimes. If you're coming into the relationship with a lot of debt, uh, the other person may not even know about it or think about it or discuss it that who's going to be, um, um, you know, responsible for this debt and what that's going to look like, right? Uh, relationships with extended families, you know, where are you going to meet, how often, uh, where are you going to spend holidays, Eids, uh, you know, all of those things, whether you're going to live with them, you know, all of these things uh, are situations which cause a lot of uh, conflict in relationships. And if you have just slid into a situation expecting something and, and the other person has different expectations, then you can understand how this would uh, create issues, right? So what, uh, you know, if you uh, just think about a situation in your own life uh, or in the life of someone else um, where you have, um, you know, not been intentional, where you have kind of drifted and found yourself in a situation where you did not um, predict it, you know, um, relationships, right, uh, with friends who, who who go too far kind of thing. So for example, if you have a relationship at work, you know, you just start out at friends, uh, you know, of the opposite sex, you start out at friends, you really, you know, very few people um, start a relationship intending to go beyond the bounds of, of marriage, of intending to cheat on their spouse, right? So you just uh, become friends and before you know it, the friendship has deepened and you make one decision which uh, is the moment, right? The moment that the slide happened, for example, you meet somebody just for a coffee without disclosing it to your spouse, right? Um, that would have a huge cost to the relationship. And, uh, you know, so, so some of these reflections are that what could the couple or what could the person have done differently to decide instead of slide? right, to be intentional, to know, uh, to be careful of the steps you take, whether it might be, you know, a debt, you know, that you're not disclosing to your spouse, or something that you spent more than you intended to, uh, or um, career-wise, or, an, you know, a relationship-wise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what could you do without, uh, you know, instead of, uh, instead of sliding? And, and this is something that you really, uh, you know, these are reflections that uh, all of us can, can uh, engage in. Now, given that all of us will be um, sliding from time to time, how do we get back on track? You know, how do we uh, get back to being intentional? And, and it starts with, uh, and this imagery is, is one of being in a boat and kind of going with the flow, going with the current and ending up somewhere downstream where you didn't intend to, right? So you first need to notice and acknowledge that you have indeed slid, you know, that you um, are in a situation which did, you did not really fully prepare for, that you did not intend. And then you also need to have a little bit of idea where you want to be, you know, is this what you want for your relationship? Is this how you want to spend your life? 
and, and then just decide, you know, become intentional. Uh, and what we would say is start paddling or rowing where you want to go. So for example, if you have a relationship which has become kind of distant or conflicted, right? No one really intends to get there. You know, when you get married, you're full of good hopes, of, of good intentions. And uh, before you know it, some things have happened and we we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, you start kind of um, uh, sliding. So once you realize that you have slid, you know, know that any moment is an opportunity to get back on track that you know, once you realize, acknowledge what's happened, you can start uh, back uh, and get back to where you want it to be. So the second key is to do your part. What does that mean? And this is, uh, this is really important because many people, right, who come um, for counseling, who come for guidance in relationship, uh, let's face it, they come to fix their spouse. Right. And, uh, you know, the most common situation is that uh, somebody has a lot of complaints uh, in their relationship, they want things to be different, and they want their spouse to change. And, and the understanding is that uh, once you, you know, once the spouse changes and gets fixed, then all your problems will, um, you know, will go away on their own. Okay. So the, the thing is, though, that the difference between happy and miserable couples, right, we really need to know this. Happy couples, uh, surprisingly, have the same number of problems than couples who are struggling and miserable. The couples who are happy are not happy because they have not, um, because they don't have personality differences, because uh, they don't have financial issues, couple issues. Uh, they have significant challenges. The difference is that they will keep focusing on what they can do in the relationship rather than focusing on how wrong their spouse is, okay? And, uh, you know, it's really not our fault because we, many of us have fallen for the myth of the 50-50 marriage. So we may have heard this a lot on Instagram. I mean, you know, Instagram, I keep giving the example on Instagram because when I see these posts, it is quite upsetting to me because a lot of times it's really bad advice, right? And so, uh, you know, Instagram will tell you things like you should be you should find somebody who adores you, who, um, uh, who you're worth it, right? Who will, uh, I don't know, give you flowers and uh, know your every thought, finish your sentences before you start them. And uh, the idea is that things should be fair and it should uh, be an equal amount of give and take, okay? Not real life, right? That's not how it happens. A good relationship, a strong relationship is actually 100%. People who are willing to give their all, their best in relationships tend to be happy in, in, in happy relationships, right? If I have the mindset, uh, I'm always calculating, I'm doing more, he's doing less, um, it's not going to work, right? Because um, it is, we call it scorekeeping. You know, so when you get into the habit of scorekeeping, know that you are in dangerous territory. That scorekeeping is not going to improve your relationship, right? Uh, and, um, you know, one of the questions that I ask myself and I ask my students is this, that can you single-handedly destroy your relationship? Can you single-handedly have a fight with your spouse? I know I can. Like if I decided today, uh, okay, you know what? Today I'm gonna have a big old fight. We haven't fought for a really long time. Let's have some excitement. I know I can probably have a fight within 30 seconds of speaking to my husband, okay? Even being like right now, he's in Canada, I'm in Pakistan, okay? So even despite the distance, I can pretty much guarantee you that I could, uh, if I wanted to, uh, start a fight, right? Having understood that, I also need to understand that if I can single-handedly destroy a relationship, I can actually also do a lot to improve it. You know, if I take the, the, 
the opportunity and the decision and the charge of controlling what I can control and focus on that. What do you think? You know, if I start doing the things that I know are going to improve my marriage, uh, chances are that it will improve. You know, uh, not every marriage, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there are not really challenging uh, spouses out there who are, uh, you know, uh, it's, it is, you know, some of us are in extremely challenging relationships, right? And the vast majority of time, when we take focus on what we can do, we start doing our part, things tend to get better. If we wait for our spouses to change before we will change, uh, unfortunately, that's a very long wait, okay? And also the good news is that it's not about huge, big things. We don't have to do sky writing and, you know, if it's your anniversary to, uh, to go so out of the way that you do a grand uh, gesture. What research shows is it's not grand gestures that predict if you are happy long term. It really is about the small things, the very small things, the moments, right? The moments of connection, uh, the moments of turning towards your spouse rather than away from, the small rituals of connection. The, the really good news is that turning a relationship around can be very, can begin with really small steps. Right. Uh, and I like to think of it as, um, you know, ships and relationships. Right. So if you have a huge, big tanker or a cruise ship, you know, huge, and one would think that it would take a lot of effort and energy to move that. But it turns out that what uh, changes the direction of a ship is we know the radar right at the end of the ship, which compared to the size of the ship is quite small. And it's not only the radar, it is what we call the trim tab on the radar, which is a small, tiny piece of metal, right? And when you change that, when you flip that, it changes the radar and it changes the direction of the ship. And really, it's about those small trim tab moments, right? Those small things that we do for each other consistently, not once in a while, but consistently that will predict whether or not we can uh, and are uh, happy long term. So what are under, what is under our control? Right, um, you know that's uh, important to understand. That uh, very often we complain about other people's behavior, uh, difference in personalities, the amount of free time, neighbors, you know, all of those things. And uh, reality is very little of that is under our control. Right, what I say and do is definitely in my control. Um, salary, our parents, um, you know, kids, my partner, all of these tend to be, you know, not really, um, you know, we can't really control any of that, right? But I can definitely control my attitude, I can control what I do, what I say. And therefore, doing your part turns out to be a very, very important, um, you know, key to maintaining your relationship. So, you know, on the practical side, you know, let's consider an issue in your relationship, okay? And um, ask yourself what you can do about it. So um, I'm just trying to think of an issue in my own relationship. Um, and very often it's about actually speaking up. Right. It is about speaking up. It is about making, uh, you know, so many times that I know I've done this in the past a lot. Right. We wait for uh, uh, we expect that our spouses will read our mind, that they will know what we want, that they will. You know, why don't they just do it? And if something really matters to us that much, focusing on our circle of control actually means speaking up you know, speaking up in a way that we are heard and that our uh, needs, desires, uh, um, you know, get to, uh, you know, we, that they understand, okay. So um, the three keys uh, to 
uh, uh, staying married. We, we talked about decide, don't slide. And then we talked about doing our part. And now the third key of, uh, you know, happily staying happily married is to make it safe or, um, you know, we can think about it is make it safe to connect. In other words, um, create a situation or uh, where people find it easy to talk to you. OK, and, and what this means. So let's talk about uh, the kinds of safety. You know, sometimes we just think of safety as physical safety. Now, obviously, physical safety in a relationship is kind of non-negotiable, right? And, and this needs to be said because very often, you know, when couples are distressed, when they come for help, uh, they are uh, using physical violence, uh, either one or both people. And it is it will never get us to where we want. Physical violence is not going to, it's, it's going to create a lot of trouble. Very often it just starts with small things, quote unquote, small things. And reality is that when, when that boundary has been crossed, when violence enters your relationship, you don't know where it's going to go. And it's going to, you know, very often it will go beyond what you intended to, and you will find yourself in um, in a, in a scary situation, right? So we'll talk about emotional and commitment safety uh, in a bit, but uh, signs of physical safety that even if there is conflict, there is quote unquote fighting. If people are not getting along, the threat of physical violence is not there. You feel safe in your spouse's, um, uh, you know. Uh, company because you know that you have no harm it's not only physical safety but it is also safety of property so uh, breaking things for example um, you know uh, hiding uh, property uh, destroying property withholding property all of that uh, is included in a lack of physical safety and, uh, you know, again, in, in many jurisdictions today in the world, we know that it will get you into a lot of trouble, right? Uh, in many places, you lose, you know, you, you really lose uh, control of yourself, of your relationship when you use violence because uh, you end up in a situation which is uh, which you never intended. It's, it's a huge slide, right? So, um, Commitment is the other kind of safety. Commitment safety means that we feel secure about our relationship together. We dream and talk about our relationship. We, um, we avoid damaging the future of our relationship by saying and doing things which, um, you know, threats of leaving, for example, right, would be the opposite of commitment safety. Very often when, when couples are deeply distressed and because uh, divorce is such an easy out these days, uh, it's... It's quick, but believe me, people who've gone through the uh, through divorce, it is not easy. Just because it's common does not mean it's one of the hardest things you will ever do. Okay, and the threat of divorce when it happens frequently is very damaging to the relationship. Because here's the thing: if uh, you know, in order to invest in a relationship, it takes a lot of courage. It takes commitment. It takes uh, self uh, restraint. Uh, sacrifices. And if I don't know if, if my spouse is going to be in the relationship long term, why would I do that, right? Why would I commit? Why would I invest if I don't know if they're going to be sticking around? Uh, and therefore, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, the more you threaten divorce, the less, um, uh, the less your partner feels safe. Uh, they feel unsafe and the more likely they are actually to leave the relationship, right? So a sign of commitment safety is, again, you invest in the relationship, right? You are courageous, you are vulnerable, uh, you show your, your weaknesses because you know that you are in good hands uh, and you have a long-term view. So you can plan, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, life permitting and all of those uh, clauses, <laughs> but, um, you know, you know that none of you are going to leave the relationship, right? 
And then the third type of uh, safety is what we call emotional safety. Emotional safety simply means that you feel emotionally safe with your spouse. You don't feel uh, that if you say something, it will be held against you, that it will be, you know, very often when couples are in a distressed state, uh, they will not share vulnerable things. They will not share fears, hopes, dreams. Why? Because they don't trust that their partner will not hold that against them. Okay, that's a very, very uh, big no-no, okay? So if somebody is sharing vulnerability, if they are sharing something that they haven't shared with someone else, we need to treat it like a sacred trust, right? We need to, uh, to treat it with kid gloves and, and it's a huge um, sign of, uh, of commitment of trust. And uh, so when we can talk about our feelings, frustrations, joys, hopes uh, in a relationship, uh, that means that there is emotional safety. We feel like friends and we feel like we're on the same team, even if you disagree, right? So none of this means that there's no conflict and that uh, you, know, you don't disagree. <laughs> but generally you are a source of comfort for the other person and that you can be yourself in the relationship. You are not scared to, uh, to find, uh, to, that, your, that your spouse will find out things about you. You, are, um, you don't have to wear a mask or walk on eggshells all the time. And, and by the way, you know, one of the uh, first things that goes when uh, couples are in distress is this feeling of <clears throat> the lack of emotional safety, you know? So, uh, one of the things that many people don't know is that you know people think that when you fight too much your relationship gets destroyed right when you are still fighting there's actually still hope i'm not saying keep fighting right but what i am saying is that if you are still sharing your frustration if you're still sharing your uh, complaints that's actually still means that you're engaged you know when people are so despondent and have lost hope that they even like kind of give up complaining you know it's just you are two uh, strangers living in the same home and you are uh, not engaged with each other you know that's a much uh, uh, as a therapist for example or somebody who deals with that's a harder relationship to to mend and to fix because you actually have to reignite uh, you know, um, even the complaining. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so um, yeah, it is, we, we say that it is emotional distance that actually destroys relationship and not uh, fights and conflict. And therefore, it is really important that we create this climate of emotional safety in a relationship so that we continue to be friends, so that we can. Um, uh, you know, maintain the kind of uh, vibrant relationship, even if it is stormy at times, right? Um, so let's see what's next. Uh, okay, so a lack of emotional safety. Actually, I'm just going to uh, pause here just for a few moments and just check in with uh, the chats. And um, let's see if there is something that... Um, oh wow! Salam alaikum, my neighbor from uh, from England. Um, so there's a question. Sometimes the moral and personal commitment clash. Um, Sometimes the moral and personal commitment clash, I ought to cook, but I really don't want to. And then you cook something basic as the kids need feeding. Um, okay, uh, I think that's just a comment. Um, small positive things compound over long term. Okay, um, uh, Musarath, were, were there any questions that you got that need answering at this point? Not at the moment, yeah. Okay, so I just keep going. Okay. So, um, you know, what, for the rest of the time, we'll be talking a little bit about this 
emotional safety and what that means, right? So what do we mean by a lack of emotional safety in particular? So lack of emotional safety shows up most when we are in the midst of conflict and how we deal with that conflict, right? So for example, uh, criticism, uh, putting the other person down, name calling, uh, stonewalling, right? Uh, refusing to get into important conversations, showing contempt for the other person is a really, um, you know, shows a lot of lack of emotional safety. So contempt means that you notice that someone is different and you look down upon them for that difference, right? Now, it sounds like who would ever do that? We do it uh, in many small ways. So you're sitting at the table and your spouse um, has a very different way of eating or tastes uh, than you. Um, you know, um, you have a birthday, you've always celebrated birthdays uh, in your family and uh, your spouse um, doesn't, you know, in, in their family, birthdays were not a thing. And you say, hmm, who does that? Who doesn't recognize birthdays, right? Seems like a simple enough statement, but there's a lot of contempt in it. It means that there is something really wrong with you if you don't follow my way of celebrating birthdays, right? That's the underlying message. And whenever we have messages like those that, you know what, you're different, your family is different, and therefore they are uh, somehow, um, uh, you know, not up to mark uh, is a way of contempt. Negative interpretations. So if I want to do something for my spouse and I go out of my way and he says, what do you want, right? What is your motive? Um, you know, you there must be some reason why you're being nice, okay? So again, you know, how likely am I going to be to want to do, um, you know, more things like that. Uh, escalation, very similar to criticism. Escalation means if I bring up something, um, a complaint, and by the way, complaints are not bad in relationships. I always tell people, please complain a lot <laughs> because that's how the other person knows, uh, you know, what, uh, what is upsetting you, but you need to do it in a way that is, uh, takes into account emotional safety, right? So if, for example, I, I tell my spouse, um, you know, mm, you left the, the cap of the, you know, of the toothpaste and it really bothers me and you do it every morning. And he responds by saying, well, you look at the way you've left the garage and you did, you know, the, the kitchen was full of crumbs and you brought up one thing, but now there are, you know, 10 things of uh, complaints thrown back at you. Okay. What are you going to do next time? You know, you are not likely to, uh, to want, uh, you're not going to be uh, open to complaining anymore. And uh, it is going to lead to emotional distance. And why? Because that is a lack of emotional safety. Okay. So we really need to understand, uh, you know, the things that we do. And very often it's very unconscious. We don't do this intentionally. And it leads to um, the uh, feeling of a lack of emotional safety for the other person. So how do we build emotional safety, right? What are the opposites of, of those habits and behaviors that we talked about that erode emotional safety? And uh, you know, one of the main ways of building emotional safety is learning to listen. Learning to listen what the other person is telling you, even learning, listening to their complaints without escalating, without uh, being defensive, without uh, criticizing them for having those or invalidating them or showing contempt you know, simply listening, uh, validating their life experience. So for example, uh, going back to the, you know, toothpaste, right? Uh, you left the tube on, you say, yeah, you know, if you, if you would just say something like, uh, I know I forgot again, sorry, right? Or I can see how frustrating it would be for you because you really like a clean counter, right? You're validating the other person's experience. It's building emotional safety. It's telling the other person, you know what? what matters to you um, is important, right? And what, what matters to me 
uh, is, um, uh, you know, what matters to you really matters to me, okay? And then um, uh, uh, appreciation. So uh, a higher level of that is even not only uh, it, it matters to me, it's important to, to me what is important to you, but you know, I appreciate a lot of things uh, about you. I have fondness for you. I admire you. You know, all of these things build emotional safety and then accountability. So if I am causing, you know, it's really hard to hear that you are the cause of your spouse's frustration, right? So for example, um, you know, if you are continuously late or you're messy or you are doing something which is causing them grief, it is, um, it's hard to take accept, to accept accountability for it, right? What happens is that, you know, when I hear something, when I hear my spouse complaining, um, obviously I'm hardwired to, to protect myself, to defend myself. And I tell myself, what? This is such a little thing. You know, it's really, this is almost always, right? That one person has a complaint and the other person will say, it's such a little thing he or she makes a big deal about little things, okay? This is a really easy way to destroy emotional safety because what I'm telling the other person is what's important to you is insignificant. It shouldn't be important, right? Reality is that if I want to build an intentional relationship, a relationship that is going to be nurturing and, and good for both of us, if something matters to my spouse, I need it to matter to me. So there are no small things. If I am complaining about the, the top of the toothpaste, my husband better take it seriously, you know, instead of saying, oh, you're, you know, this is ridiculous and look at you and, and all of that, right? A really easy way to make me happy is simply saying, sorry, you know, sorry, I did that. I'm going to try my best. I know I keep forgetting. That's a very different stance with which you, we come to complaints of our spouses rather than invalidating them, minimizing them and, and saying that, you know what, what, what means what is important to you is simply not not important to me, but not important, right? What do we say? It's such a little thing. It's such a little thing. Why are you making such a big deal about it? Um, so this is like a like a huge point, right? If something is important to our spouse, it needs to be important to us. So uh, just to to summarize. Um, you know, the three keys to staying happily married that we talked about. Uh, one, number one, decide, don't slide. In other words, be intentional, you know, um, know uh, that what you are doing, where you're going is going to be, um, you know, you, if you drift, you're not going to be happy, right? Uh, secondly, do your part instead of waiting for your spouse to change or always complaining about what they're doing. Do what you can to improve the relationship, right? Take 100 respons part responsibility for your own behavior uh, rather than waiting for the other person to change. And thirdly, make it safe. Make it safe uh, for the person to connect, to reach you by not minimizing their complaints, by honoring them, by validating them, by listening to them and uh, you know, acknowledging that what is important to them is important to you. We talked about three kinds of safety, uh, physical safety, commitment safety, and, uh, and emotional safety. So um, I would just like you to pause for just one minute, just reflect. We've covered a lot of ground. Obviously, uh, this is, you know, it could easily be like a six week workshop, which is generally how I do it. <laughs> but these are just, you know, really uh, short highlights uh, of some of the things. So what are your key takeaways? What are you going to remember from today? And what more importantly, what are you going to be doing differently? This is. Um, you know, uh, how we, uh, we change lives is by taking one small step, you know, doing one little thing differently. So while you are doing that, and please do write it in the chat box, I would, you know, it's always uh, really um, validating uh, for me to hear what people have, what has landed, or what people have taken away, um, you know, what they're going to remember and what they're going to do differently.
And of course, uh, if you wanted uh, more information, uh, it's on the slide. Um, you know, all the websites, there's a lot of free uh, content uh, through blogs, uh, podcasts, uh, Facebook uh, lives, um, you know, you can, um, there, there's quite a lot of material out there. And um, the slides, if you wanted a copy of the slides, uh, just go to marziahassan.org slash handouts. Just give me a few moments though. Uh, they will, it will, it, they're not up right now. It's an older version, which is going to be uh, replaced. So I will uh, put these slides up maybe in the next, uh, in the next 12 hours. Okay. Uh, so they will be there. So please check back either later today depending on your time zone uh, or tomorrow morning and inshallah they should be up uh, so that is all i had for for now and i'm happy to take uh, to take questions thank you thank you so much this was really insightful really informative as well thank you very much um i think it's brought some questions um i think when you started off at the beginning talking about the modern uh, marriages and the historic marriages um obviously it's a lot of people haven't realized that there is a differences uh with the historic marriages because we usually look at our parents marriages and kind of take uh from there um so regarding obviously um as you said the contributing factor at that time is um in, with obviously uh, modern marriages is obviously one of the key factor is the differences in the role of women uh, women working um that kind of thing as well so what advice can you give in-laws um how to adopt their relationship with couples especially with this more modern marriages okay i'm not sure if it's an in-law asking uh, or or the couple themselves because you know uh, the way i look at it uh, and i often say this that i'm in the self-help business not other help business right so uh, my recommendation is always when you hear something see how you can apply it uh, we will always find uh, you know for many years when i started doing this work my relationship actually became worse because i became really good at uh, catching my spouse, my children, when they were doing things wrong, right? And reality was that even if I knew something, it didn't help me. It actually made things worse, right? Uh, and again, it goes back to doing your part. So if you are, uh, um, you know, a couple, uh, if you are an in-law, um, you know, I'm happy to answer that. If you are a couple that you want to, to tell your in-laws, um, that's a bit more challenging, right? You can, again, uh, you know, when I'm doing a longer training, uh, learn how to speak in a way that you get understood, you know, speak for yourself, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't blame others, share your own experience. So for example, uh, when I come home from work and and I hear things like women shouldn't work, it upsets me because I think my work is being minimized, for example, right? That is not accusing anyone, it is simply speaking from your frame of reference and sharing uh, how um, how things are impacting you, right? Uh, if you are an in-law, so what was the question again about the in-laws? Um, how to kind of prepare the in-laws uh, for modern marriages? Um, if because obviously, if they're um, the in-laws have had the historic marriages, or you know, like their marriages been different yeah. to the modern marriages, how do they kind of transition? Because a lot of time they would probably be comparing. At my time, I used to do this. I yes. used to do that. How do you kind of transition them to accept modern marriages? Yes, yes. Uh, very, very, uh, a very long question, right? So, uh, how do you transition them? That is not your responsibility right and your responsibility is to to be honest and authentic about how you wish to to uh, you know if you wish to work that is a conversation between yourself and your husband if it's a woman i'm i'm assuming answering the asking the question and if you are on the same page uh, then it is much easier right if you're not on the same page then then you need some work to do right you you know get help see somebody uh, you know learn how to speak about these things in a way that um, will get you closer to understanding very often uh, you know with big situations like this say for example one person uh, wants children the other one doesn't you know one person wants uh, to work but the the husband has always had this idea that my wife should stay at home 
right? These are uh, what we call unsolvable problems, right? So these are not problems that can um, that can really be solved. You can't change somebody's, uh, uh, you know, if, if that's what they want, that's a preference, right? But what you can do is to keep talking about it, right? And to come closer to understanding. We think that it is simply, um, you know, we just need to solve every problem and everything uh, has a solution, right? And very often, uh it is um, you know couples are surprised to hear that a lot of issues don't have solutions you know this i i i i really hesitate to say it in 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 uh, in a forum like this because it gives uh, despair to people but it's not meant for despair it is just reality that the things that you're arguing about um uh, I'll, I'll give you one example. So in my marriage, uh, I've been married well over 30 years, right? And uh, we've always argued about lots of things, right? About um, how important is it to be on time for social functions, right? My husband has preference of always being on time he thinks it's a mark of respect me going up in pakistan thinks that you know if you show up somewhere on time people will look at you and they won't be ready right so have we um, been able to solve this problem no we haven't we still disagree on it uh, and we don't let it destroy our relationship right there were times that it was so conflicted that we became more polarized you know so the more he would you know he would get ready 15 minutes early and sit in a bad mood for example till i got ready right and and the more he would do that i would get stressed and frustrated and upset at him uh, but now we kind of laugh about it and we realize that this is just one of those things where it's a different preference and we're not going to change the other person do we have a greater understanding of the other yes right and that's what we're hoping for so even things that you disagree on you can certainly um use it as a bridge for understanding right you can use it as fodder for good communication for all of those things so um yeah i think that i i'm not sure if that answers the question or not okay. i know because obviously um couples usually before getting married they probably go on a course now or you know to understand better how to make the marriages work so i was just wondering if there was any courses for in-laws but i don't think i've heard any courses for in-laws on there um, you know i actually on that note i actually developed a whole course on in-laws right and yes it's got enough content to to write a book about it and when i um, when i advertised this obviously i don't know if it was wrong no one signed up like it was zero <laughs> so i i never ran it but uh, i know this is a big issue and i have done webinars and stuff on it as well so if you dig i don't please don't ask me where it is but i don't know but if you dig enough on the internet with my name and all of that you might it was called welcome to the family right was uh, was the title so you might find it uh, there is a question here which is um if you uh, would like to work on your relationship and if you have suggested it to your spouse, but they're unwilling to get outside help, how do you go about it? Okay, very good question. A question that gets asked very often. And, um, you know, the challenge is that if you want to do couples counseling, many uh, couples counselors will not see you if you if both people are not uh, a part of it right uh, i try to look at it a little bit differently i don't like to punish the person who is motivated <laughs> by telling them that they cannot do the counseling if their spouse is not involved so there are counselors who will work who will agree to work on your relationship with one person so if you are in that situation i would really strongly suggest please don't wait do not wait for your spouse to come on board. Like I said before, if you can single-handedly destroy a relationship, you can also do a lot to improve it, right? Very often what happens, and this happens with me all the time, that one couple, one member of the couple will start working, uh, you know, in counseling, they will come for therapy. The other uh, person is very resistant. They don't want to come. And I'm like, fine, you know, don't wait for them. You start. 
when their spouse notices the changes, how, you know, what things are happening, very often, not all the time, but often they become much more amenable to counseling because, you know, here's the reality. There is a lot of baggage in our communities around seeking help. Right? It's a matter of shame, especially for men. There is an idea that you, there's something wrong with you, that you have failed. There's a lot of baggage. So do, I actually don't blame people if they don't want to come for counseling. And the good news is you really don't have to go for counseling in order to, to improve your relationship. Right? You can read a book. Uh, we do, uh, at least in our community, we do courses like twice a year. Uh, you know, six week courses, and now they're virtual. So they're open to all over the world. Uh, and uh, even people who are not willing to do counseling often attend because it's a much less threatening environment. You don't need to share anything personal. You don't need to, you know, delve into your history or your dark, deep secrets. You can be behind. I mean, I always encourage people to put their video on, but you don't have to if you don't want to. You don't have to say anything. You can just be a fly on the wall, do the exercises on your own. So it's a much safer way. You know, people feel uh, more comfortable in that situation, right? So um, absolutely, please don't wait. Uh, you do what you can, you know, do your part. So I think we've got another question. Is there any guidance when to have um, chats with your spouse? Sometimes, obviously, you need to park it for a better moment. Um, and then, obviously, what do you recommend? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Great question. So in every cup, you know, a lot of people are, you know, I have a problem. I need to discuss it before I sleep, right? Many of us are like that. And 90% of the time, people like that are married to people who never want to discuss any issue ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, a very common situation. It's not uncommon. Um, so here's the thing. Pick a good time. A good time means what? That obviously, if one or both of you is upset and you're already triggered and you're in the middle of what we call an emotional hijack and you are angry at each other, not a good time to have this conversation right? It's also not a good time to never have the conversation. So what I recommend to couples is, you know what, have couple meetings, like set aside a time during the week, not date night, not, uh, you know, when a hundred things are going on, but just say, you know what, let's check in with each other. There's something I want to bring up. So let's talk about it Thursday morning, Friday night, whatever works for you. Okay. Uh, and then persist because if you are married to somebody who never wants to talk about things, uh, you need to persist. You can't just give it up uh, and uh, never bring up the conversation because, again, what research shows is that uh, relationships which are very conflict avoidant are not healthy relationships, you know, because uh, you, you do need to have the courage to have difficult conversations. Excellent. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, um, you can unmute yourself. You've explained it so yeah. well. Yes, um, Salam alaikum. Have you got a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask. Um, I, I'm not sure if I caught it right, but um, are you saying that if the other, um, you know, the other party is not prepared to for anyone to mediate, one can still unilaterally solve the problem? Uh, so okay. Uh, so good. Sorry, was that your whole question? Did you have more? Yeah, so uh, because in as you know, it's I mean, as you said, it's a very common situation, isn't it? So mm -hmm. is it possible to just work on one, either the husband or the wife mm -hmm. and make the situation better and improve the marriage? Okay, so uh, great question, first of all. So thank you. So the question is that, you know, can you work single-handedly with one person to improve the situation, right? I would say yes and not always, <laughs> okay? So the thing is that when, say for example, if I'm working with one person, right? They're coming with some challenge in their relationship, their spouse is not on board, they want to, uh, they still want to come. 
So the way I would work with them, first of all, is to help them explore what they have done, what they have tried, how they could try things differently. Right. So, for example, very often when we and me too, you know, when I am in trouble, I need to speak to someone because I may know all the theory, but when it's my own stuff, I get as triggered as somebody else. Right. So if, um, uh, you know, a person that is working single handedly on their relationship would explore, you know, what have you done? What have you tried? How can you try something else? Right. This does not mean that you're only going to get this thing that, you know what, and just be patient and inshallah things will work out. No, it could be stand up for yourself. Right. It could be set boundaries. It could be, you know what, you're complaining about having too much work to do uh, and yet you're doing it all. Why not not do it? Right? Uh, is it whose choice is it? And what would happen if you didn't? Right? What would happen if you let the dishes be? The world would not end, promise. Like that would not be the cause of the world ending, right? So if you are overstretched, overburdened, and taking on too much in the relationship, working one-to-one -one with someone like that would mean that you do some self-care. You know, you, you show yourself some compassion, you learn to speak up, you learn to set boundaries, you learn to communicate in a way that may be more acceptable to the other person. Right. So can um, uh, can you do things? Absolutely. You can do a lot. And does this guarantee that your relationship will change? No. Right? The short answer is no, because this is not about manipulating someone else. It is about you taking charge of your own life, your own situation, and, and see how you can improve it, given that the other person is not open to seeking help at this point. Right? Yeah, so I think sure. that makes sense. Exactly. Thank you. We've right. got another, another one in yeah, Sorry, have you got another question? Yeah, the other question is, um, I mean, I do a lot of marriage counseling myself, but I just want to know, like, uh, you know, the, this idea of staying in a marriage for the sake of the children. I, I, did, I did miss parts of your lecture, so I'm okay. not sure if you actually covered this one, but what would you say to, them, to, say to this, you know, that I don't want the, the children to grow up without a father, is this a valid logic or a valid reason to stay in a marriage? Um, so who am I speaking to? Because I can't see anyone and okay. I don't know. I'm Kurratul Okay. Yes. Okay. So you want me to start the video? <laughs> I would love to because I would love to, you know, I mean, for me, it's really hard to speak to blanks. Okay, inshallah. I'll briefly start the video. Inshallah. Um, I don't know. Okay. So um, the question is that would, is it okay to stay in the um, relationship for mm. the children, right? Yes. Again, not an easy yes or no question, mm. right? Mm. Uh, I like to uh, uh, approach it maybe it's slightly different. So is our children, do children benefit from a two parent family? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do they, do children suffer when there is a divorce? Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. let's not uh, make any bones about it. Uh, lots of research, <coughs> children do best in two parent homes. However, mm -hmm. with a great big caveat, they do best when okay. there are two parents getting along, right? Mm -hmm. So <coughs> if you are staying together for the sake of the children, I would say if it's an abusive marriage, you're not doing your children any favors. True. If it is a conflicted marriage, then I would use the same kind of procedure that I would working on anyone who wants to work on their relationship without their spouse's involvement, which is do what you can, right? Uh, take charge of your own self, do self-care, you know, very, very important. Have self-compassion, you know, um, do all of those things, learn to communicate in a way that is not blaming, that is not defensive, that is not escalating. Do your part. Same exact thing, right? Do your part. After that, um, even if the relationship works or doesn't work, you know, reality is that, yes, there are many people who are in relationships which they are not willing to leave and which are very unhealthy, 
would I ever counsel somebody to leave a relationship? Absolutely not. That's not my job. Yes. Sure. Okay. So if a person tells me I am in this relationship for the sake of my kids, okay, my first question was, are your kids safe? Because safety trumps everything. If the kids are being abused, you know, then that's a different level, right? If kids are not being abused, if it's just conflict, if it's like different personalities, then, you know, let's see what we can do, given that you have decided to stay, right? Given that you are in this relationship, why not do what you can to make it better if you can? Sure. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> Actually, I do have a lot of questions, but I don't want to give other, I want to give other people a chance, inshallah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we do have a question. Um, it says, what can you do when your partner gets defensive when you try to improve things? It happens a lot. Obviously, women sometimes are more aware. They join in different sessions. I'm sure today we've had so many ladies joining in and this conversation would be something that's happening at dinner time today or later on tonight. Um, so what do you do when your partner gets defensive when you're trying to improve things? Uh, gets defensive when you are trying to improve things. So my suspicion, and I don't know this person and I don't, but my suspicion is that the way we are trying to improve things, been there, done that, right? I'm speaking from experience. The way we are doing this is pointing out how wrong they are, you know, uh, so often, like couples will say, you know, I used you as an example. And I said, sister, Marzia said, this is not what you should do with your children. And this is not what you should. I'm like, listen, first rule that sister Marzia says is don't use what you learn to make your relationship worse. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, if you are saying it in a way that is accusatory, that is critical, you know, the, the flip side of criticism is that people will be defensive. Right. So again, doing your part means that you say it in a way and the best way, honestly, is I learned something. This is what I noticed about myself and this is what I am going to do differently. Honestly, that's the best thing you can do for your relationship. Many people here, and I know that from experience, are here to learn things so that they can tell their spouse how they're wrong. And I'm already telling you that that's not going to work. It's not. If you are learning things to help yourself, it will work. If you are learning things to tell your spouse how they're wrong, it will make things work. So please save your time. Right? Don't do it. Uh, don't do it. Okay, excellent. I'm glad you mentioned that. So we all know how to speak tonight if we are talking um, in that way as well so it's not the dependent. most inspiring thing like the best value for your time would be this is what I noticed I was different doing wrong or that I could do better and this is what I am going to work on this is how you can improve your relationship you will not improve your relationship by noticing what your spouse is doing wrong and and sharing that okay uh, there are a couple of questions uh, one is um, oops, hang on. You want me to read that no, question? Sorry, there's a couple of questions here. One is how to handle over emotional wife. Should we just listen when she's in a bad mood, even if she's wrong? Um, <laughs> I'm really not sure how to answer that because I don't know the situation. I don't, if, you know, many women are frustrated over a long period of time at being not listened to. And what I would suggest that you read some stuff on uh, what we call, um, not uh, it's just gone completely off but not ghosting but um what somebody help me out you know when you are telling the person that they're wrong like you are messing with their head it's a very common uh gaslighting somebody said sorry 
gaslighting is gaslighting that what gaslighting uh, so i would really suggest and i've written a lot about it on my blog so if you go to marziahasan.org slash blog you know just uh, uh, search for gaslighting and and uh, musarat if you find something you know please feel free to put it in the chat as well um, you know when people are consistently told that they are over emotional that what they're uh, thinking uh, doesn't matter that they are overreacting that they uh, are hysterical that is what causes the over quote unquote over emotional uh, thing right and so i don't know what the situation is even if she's wrong uh, you know people have their experiences if you listen if you validate if you try to understand uh, you will you might notice that uh, she has a point and her frustrations are coming from somewhere right and this is both for men and women so what if your starting years were very difficult uh, when you got married and you were really affected by all of that mentally and emotionally and you keep on remembering then what can you do about it? Okay, very good question. Uh, yes, so um, I would say, you know, take care of yourself, work on, uh, work with someone one-on-one -on, -one on on forgiveness, on letting go, uh, on all of that, right? And it's not, um, it's not something you have to do, by the way, because, you know, no one says you have to, if you've been, uh, you know, if it's been upsetting to you, obviously you're going to remember, right? Obviously you're going to grieve, but you may not have ever given your chance, uh, yourself a chance to, to acknowledge the pain, to grieve. And, and working with someone might be uh, just, you know, helping you um, name it, right? Name that what happened was not okay and that it impacted you. So I would suggest, you know, please do reach out to someone in your community or, or someone uh, who you can, uh, you know, who you can work with. Question of the woman wants to leave because the relationship does not serve, but the husband or alim does not help out as the husband has the power to initiate divorce. The basic needs are provided, but the emotional is, uh, sorry, not there. I know someone who was in this situation. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. There is, uh, you know, uh, there's no easy answer to that, right? I wish I could say this is what she should do. Uh, again, she should uh, get support for herself you know, whatever situation she finds herself, because women are often very critical of themselves. And they're not only critical of themselves, but they get very little support from the community, right? Just telling a woman like that, that this is a hard situation, and that you are, um, uh, you know, there's no right or wrong, it's your choice, if you, you know, if you are, uh, you know, being forced to stay in this relationship, what are some of your options? How can you take care of yourself? Uh, you know, all of these uh, would help. Yeah, your husband, um, if you approach it as something you want to improve, your husband can help and support you as you go into a better version of you. You can't force people to change, but we can always change for the better. A husband may be inspired by efforts to change for the better, but we just point fingers at them. Uh, they, of course, be hurt and defensive as would be if they did that to us. Uh, yes, there are situations uh, like that, uh, for sure. Uh, and, you know, some uh, people are genuinely in challenging situations, right? So I am not here to, to tell people that, you know, what they're going through is, <laughs> uh, is, not, is not valid. You know, each one needs to decide that for themselves. I think that's all in terms of questions. Um, obviously, um, we'll, um, Sister Marzi has put her details on there. If anybody wants to ask anything, her Facebook page, her Instagram page as well, her websites as well. Um, inshallah, we will share the recording in the um, Ikra Library WhatsApp group. Um, I'll pass it on to Sister Marzi as well, the recording as well. And uh, once we get the, the slides as well, we will share it in the Ikra Library WhatsApp group as well. But thank you so much to Sister Marzi. Um, definitely not an easy topic um, than what it seems, but you've covered it really well. And I love the fact that you've given the three keys, something for us to all focus on, inshallah. Um, but thank you so much to all of you for joining in. Um, and inshallah, uh, we can all you know, do our best, do our part as well. And I'm sure all of us have taken something uh, from this session that we will focus on and reflect on as well. Um, thank you so much, Sister Marzia, and thank for your you. time, for your efforts. May Allah bless you. May Allah reward you. 
And uh, we look forward to, I mean, uh, when you do any sessions globally as well, virtual ones, please do post, um, send the post to me and I'll share it in the in the group and inshallah we can all benefit inshallah. from them. Thank, Thank you. you. And, you know, let it not be the end of the conversation. If, yeah. uh, you know, um, whatever you've learned, please share that, uh, you know, tag me and uh, inshallah we will all help each other move forward. Thank you so much. We look forward to having you some more times for different topics. Um, let this topic digest with everyone. Let's work on it. And inshallah, we'll have you again um, next time. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Can I ask one last question? Um, what's the best way to contact you? Uh, so I've given all the, um, the information. Oh, you have. Okay, yes. okay. So the the website uh, has a contact form, which okay, will sir. go to. But yeah, I can't obviously answer uh, questions via email. But if people need it, yeah, that's to fine. The session or whatever. That's. I'll, I'll share your details um in the Ikra Library group, so everyone's got those details as well. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Sure. Insha. Okay. Jazakallah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Dafis. Dafis.